this morning, the title of our message is, Before You Can Build, You Have to Dig. Before you can build, you have to dig. And I'm going to Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. And then we'll get there in a moment. With Charles started our new series of messages uh, last week with a message called Stir It Up. And uh, the, the sort of theme of the, of the messages is about building and rebuilding the church um, post-COVID, post whatever we need to do to rebuild the church. Um, and his focus last week was specifically on Shekinah Church, which is where we are. Doesn't mean the rest doesn't need rebuilding or building up, but that's where he started. I want to say to you this morning that everyone has their time. You may think that you don't have your time, but everyone has their time in God. Because he calls whom he chooses to do what he decides at his time and his purpose. And he can do that. Why? Because he's God. And he also disciplines his people when they stray and when they need it. Not when they don't. He's not a God who's out to get us. But when we stray, he sometimes has to discipline us. And that happened with the people of Israel in the 5th century BC. They were taken off into exile in Babylon, a foreign nation. And after 70 years, they began to return to their promised land. And they had to rebuild what they found there. Um, now, but not everyone was carried off. Some actually stayed in Jerusalem during the exile. And they had their time because they weren't carried off. But they didn't really use it very well. They had 70 years to start rebuilding the temple. They had 70 years to start rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. They had 70 years to continue establishing the word of God in their lives and following the practices of God. In the end, what they did was they used the stones of the temple and the walls to build their houses. They didn't do very well. But then came Zerubbabel. He came back with a group of people and his task, his time, his purpose was to rebuild the temple of God using what he had, the meager resources, and he built. It took him and his people nearly 20 years to rebuild the temple, quite a long time. And when it was done, all the people, a lot, well, a lot of the people just said, oh, it's not as good as the last one, is it? It's not as big, it's a bit small. Where's the glory of God that filled the temple? 20 years of hard work, and that's the feedback. And then came Ezra with another group of people. And he, his purpose was to reestablish the law of God in the lives of the people of Israel. And he read the Torah and there were all sorts of things going on. Marriages were not right and people had done things in the wrong way and the intermarrying and all sorts of things. And he tried to sort it out. It was a partial success. And then comes this guy, Nehemiah. And he comes back with resources. And his job... His purpose is to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he does it in 52 days. Pretty good, eh? And at the end, there's a big celebration, but we've not got there yet. Nehemiah was stirred 
by God to go back to Jerusalem with a group of people to rebuild the city walls that have been torn down when the people have taken off into exile to Babylon. That was his time. That was his purpose. That was his job. And I want to say, ask you a question this morning. When and what and where and how? That's four questions. Is our time? When is our time? Where is our time? What is our time? How is our time? Think about that as I'm speaking this morning. Charles spoke last week about being stirred up and he he focused on two particular things. Am I being stirred by God? Are you being stirred by God? Are we together being stirred by God? I want to look at the example of Nehemiah for a few minutes, well, maybe more than a few minutes, to see how he was stirred. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. It's coming up on the screen Um, I'll read it. You can read along with me if you you want. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Susa, the city, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant that are in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Now, Nehemiah was not back in Jerusalem. You may have gathered that. He was in the court of King Artaxerxes and were in the 5th century B.C., And he encounters this guy who's come back from Jerusalem, one of the brothers, as it were. And so he asks for a report. And he asks a question in two parts. How are the people and how is Jerusalem? How are the people and how is the physical property of the the place? Now, at this point, I would contend Nehemiah doesn't know it's his time. He doesn't know what God's plan is. He's just concerned about his people. He's just concerned about what's going on back in Jerusalem. And Hanani gives him the answer in two parts. The people are in trouble and shame, and the walls and the gates are broken and burned. And as a result of that answer, Nehemiah is stirred up. Now, important thing. When he's stirred up, he doesn't go running off straight to the king. Excuse me, Artaxerxes, I've got something to say. I need to go back to Jerusalem. My people are in shame. The walls are broken down. I've got a job to do. He doesn't do that. Nehemiah takes time to dig down. In the next verses we read about his prayer. It's time for Nehemiah to dig down to see what foundation is there in his life. Is he up to what God is calling him to do? Now most of you know that I'm an architect and as an architect, I, I work on a lot of people's houses and often someone will come to, come to me and say, I want to build this extension on my house. I want it two stories, I want to join on here, I want to put another three floors on top of the existing structure um, or something like that. And I have to say to them, right at the very beginning, before you can build up, we need to check what's underneath to see if there's a strength there to build on. To see if your foundation has the capacity to take the extra load that it will come on it through this building up. And that is what Nehemiah is doing, I believe. Now, some places are great. I did a job in Portreath a couple of years ago, up, up on top of the hill. And there was a house built on the top of this hill and as we dug down about six inches below the ground we hit solid rock. The house was literally built on the rock. 
But as you might know, some of the houses in Penzance are just built on the earth. You dig down and there's not very much there. Foundations vary. Now I know what, you, what you're thinking. You're thinking, we're about to purchase this building. We're about to start launching a building project. This is what this sermon series is all about. They're just winding us up, ready for the building project. They're just getting us ready to come along as a team and get our hands dirty and get this building sorted out. Well, that's partly true. But it's not the whole story. Because this is not just about a building project. It's a living parable to teach us lessons in faith and how we can go deeper into spiritual things. To see the significance of what we are called to do and to be in God. And how we can work as a team, together, as God's people, to build not just the physical resource of God's plan, but the people, the other part of Nehemiah's answer. We don't want to get too inward looking over these next few years, I suggest, rather than months. We don't want to be people who say, oh, it was better before, wasn't it? <laughs> before we had that nice lift to get people up and down. Oh, I like the stairs. <laughs> we don't want to be people who say, the food was better in Egypt. <laughs> Little story. Many, many years ago when, uh, when I was about to go to Bible college uh, and we were in a Baptist church in London um, in our sort of, I guess, mid-twenties or getting towards 30-ish, um, um, we didn't have anywhere to live. And um, as I was going to Bible college and I was going to be the assistant pastor of the, church, of the Baptist church, the church um, took it upon themselves to provide somewhere for us to live. Being London, they couldn't afford to buy another house. So what we decided to do was to, they had a church hall, a bit like this, sort of, this sort of size, um, and they did, we decided to cut a slice off the end, not literally cut it off, but to put a wall in so there's a slice off the end, and build a flat for me and Amanda, and actually Harriet, because Amanda was pregnant at the time, um, so to, for us to live in. And it was, it was okay, because there was already someone living in the church, a, a young girl called Nadia, who was uh, converted from a Muslim background and has not getting on to, too well with her family because of her faith, and she was living there already. And so it was a great project to do, a great building project. The problem with building projects is they become all-consuming. All you start to forget about other things. You start not to realize what other people are thinking. And it got to the point in this building project where we were working so hard to make this flat because we had a deadline to move in and Amanda was getting more and more pregnant and we needed to be moved in before Harriet was born. And, and it was about, th I can't remember how long it was, it was, about four weeks before she was born when we moved in. And, um, but, and, and, and Nadia was there living in, in, in this sort of building site. And one day we got there and um, Nadia was in her shower and the shower looked onto a light well and it was it had like a sort of leaded glass window, and she was painting the leaded glass with red gloss paint. And I said, what are you doing? Why are you painting the glass with red gloss paint? And she said, well, no one's doing anything in my bit of the flat, they're all working on yours. I've been forgotten. And it was true. In the enthusiasm to make something good, we'd forgotten what was there already. We'd forgotten the person that was already living there. And we had to say sorry, and we had to change things, and we had to do things differently. We got it wrong. And building projects like that, like Nehemiah building the walls, like when we get around to doing something in the church here, can become all-consuming, but they need not to take over from looking after the people. Back to Nehemiah. Digging. Digging can take many different forms. Spiritual digging I'm talking about here. Nehemiah's digging appears to be in prayer. But I think what he's actually doing as he prays is digging to see the extent 
of his own faith. Does he have the faith that it will require to go and do what he needs to do? In other words, to be honest and to be himself before the king. Let's have a look at Nehemiah's prayer. Um, it's not going to come up on screen, so if you've got your Bible, turn to the beginning of Nehemiah. Chapter 1, verses 4 to 11 is Nehemiah's prayer, and just follow it through with me. Just going to be a quick whiz through this. So this is Nehemiah's prayer, and this is what it says at the beginning. It says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. So let's stop there. This was not a quick process. This was not a, oh Lord, give me strength. Right, I'm off to see the king. <laughs> he sat down. He considered what the message that had been given, that the people were, were broken and in shame, that the walls was, were burnt and the gates were torn down. He took days. He mourned, it says, over the situation. And it says, I continued fasting, this is still verse four, I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah, in his digging, had some discipline. He didn't say, I'm gonna do 30 days of Bible study and after two, give up. He didn't say, I'm going to get up at 6.30 in the morning and pray for an hour every day and then after a week, sleep in. He kept praying and fasting. He had the discipline to continue. And this is what he says. He says, verse 5, and, and I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps, keep his commandments. He reminds himself of who God is. He knows all those things already. Surely he's been a follower of God, of, of God for, for all his life. You know, he's, he's grown up in that tradition. He, it's not need to him that he's realizing, oh, God loves me. I hadn't really realized that before. But he reminds himself of these things. Stirring up his faith. Stirring up his faith. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves of who God is. God who keeps his covenant in steadfast love. And then verse six. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. Does he know God's listening? Yeah, of course he does. Does he know God hears everything? Yeah, of course he does. But he's reminding himself, he's reminding himself of the process. He's asking God, hear my prayer, hear my prayer. This is not a flippant thing. It's something that's very, very serious, and he's taking it seriously. And so the, he goes on, for confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. So the first thing he does is he confesses the sin of Israel. Not... Oh, those people in Jerusalem, they've sinned. But the sins of Israel, that we, we, he's including himself. It's a corporate thing. He's part of the, of the problem. We have sinned against you. He admits things have not gone God's way. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. He admits it's all gone wrong. 
Verse 9, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. Now, that's exactly what has happened to the people of Israel. They've been scattered. God's discipline has come upon them because of what they've done. They've been unfaithful. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen. He recalls God's promise of mercy. He recalls that God says, even though I scatter you, I will bring you back if you return to me. And God will make a place for his name. God will always make a place for his name. And his place in this building is in us. God's name is in us. It's written on our hearts. And then he focuses in. They, the people of Jerusalem, are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. They, they, the people in Jerusalem. And then there comes the cruncher. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in to fear in your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Having done all that, he then asks God for favor. He's beginning to realize it's his time. He's beginning to realize that God might have a plan. He's beginning to realize that there's something going on here, that, the, that it's no accident that Hannah and I came to Jerusalem and gave that report. It's no accident that Nehemiah asked him those questions. It's no accident that those answers came back. It's no accident that he's had to dig deep to find the faith to go before the king. The king was his boss. He's done some digging. Nehemiah has, and it's time to start building. What do we need to dig? How do we need to dig in our lives where we are? That's not our context. We're not in exile. We're not working for the king. We're not in that situation that Nehemiah is in. We're in all sorts of different places. What do we need to consider as we look to when God, what God has for us as individuals and as a church. How do we need to dig? Are you being stirred? Now I'm looking at this screen at the back here and I'm thinking I've been very still and I, need, I want to see how far I can wander. So um, about there, that's the edge, isn't it? That's the edge, and I can go to about, <laughs> oh, about there, there, yeah, there, I'm all right there. Does anyone remember, is anyone old enough to remember a mime artist called <laughs> Marcel Marceau? You remember him? French guy, white face, sort of clownish type dress. He inspired David Bowie in his stage shows, and David Bowie used to do this thing where he's sort of pretending to break out of a glass box, and he was like sort of, He'd get to the edge and he's like, <laughs> trying to, to, to feel the edge of this glass box. And he'd go to the other side and he's like, trying to feel the edge of this glass box. And it was a great show. Uh, and then, I can't remember if this is true or not, or if it's just in my head. But at some point he would try and break the glass. And he, he, he'd come up to the, to the glass and he'd get his fist ready, and I might need some help here, Hector. Um, 
and he, he, he's, he's sort of come up to the glass and he's, he find, he find the glass, something like that, he find the glass, and he'd go, oh, and he'd break the glass. I'll try it again. Oh. And the glass would shatter. And he'd be running around and, and he'd be enjoying himself and he'd be in the audience and he'd be, uh, you know, say, hi. And he'd be singing, you know, Diamond Dogs or something like that. And uh, Rebel Rebel. And I better get back, otherwise people on the internet will be wondering what I'm doing. Uh, why am I telling you that? <laughs> you don't know, do you? Because sometimes we think we can't do it. Sometimes, Tracy, we think we're stuck in the box and these walls that we can't see are holding us in. And God says, the glass box is unreal. And that might be um, a spiritual battle. It might be a physical battle. It might be an emotional battle that we face. But Nehemiah, after all that he went through in that prayer, was ready to say, grant him mercy in the sight of this man because I'm cut bearer to the king. And so we can ex escape glass boxes and we can sort of go wandering off sometimes and we can uh, <coughs> hit our head on the, on the brick wall because not all boxes are unreal. Some are quite real. And... You know, if you go walk into a brick wall, you get a bit of bruising on your face. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I didn't really hit my head, Marina. <laughs> You're looking concerned there. So Nehemiah needed faith to go before the king because his job was an important job. And in his position... He didn't go before the king with a sad face. Because if you went before the king with a sad face, you were likely to lose your head. Literally. Now, it may sound a great job being cupbearer to the king. But there's a snag with this job. You see, kings in those days were not always popular people. And sometimes people tried to kill them. And one of the ways they tried to kill them was by poisoning. And so the cupbearer not only brought the gold cup with the king's wine in to the king, but the king could say to him, just have a taste of that, Nehemiah, before I drink it. And Nehemiah would have to drink from the cup. And if he didn't drop down dead, then the king would say, okay, I'll have that. Hopefully Nehemiah didn't spit in it first, but you know, we won't go there. Um, it was a risky job. A more accurate description would have been poison taster to the king. <laughs> he needed more faith to go before the king and reveal his true self, his sadness about the plight of his own people in Jerusalem. Now let's step back a bit and look at the bigger picture a bit. There were three waves of returnees in the exile, I believe. You can disagree with me on this if you want. The first group of people that went back were under the command of Zerubbabel. And his task was to rebuild the temple. And that was uh, about 536 BC. And then Ezra came with another group of people to expound the law, about 455 BC. And then Nehemiah returned to rebuild the wall. Tough gig, much opposition, but did what he was asked in 445 BC. Now, applying that to today, I need to speak to those who are not here this morning. Those who are off in exile as it were, maybe of their own choice, or maybe God's put them there. And maybe they will never hear what I'm saying. Ezra wasn't in Jerusalem during the exile. Nehemiah wasn't in Jerusalem during the exile. There, there were some people there, 
people who did what they had to do, survive. And there are those people who, over the last couple of years, have wandered off, if you like, from this church. Some stopped coming during COVID and still haven't come back for all sorts of reasons. Or maybe they've wandered off because they've felt hurt. Or maybe they've wandered off become, because they've become disillusioned with Christianity. But they've gone. See, Nehemiah was actually, on the face of it, doing quite well. Not in Jerusalem, not in the Promised Land. He had a responsible, if dangerous, job. He would have had a nice life, apart from when he had to try the cup. He would have worn fine clothes. He would have had privileges. He would have had influence. He had access to power. See, not, not everyone who is not here is having a miserable time. Some are having a great life. And they don't see any reason to come back at all. But Nehemiah was stirred. And I wonder if God is stirring the hearts of some of those who we once knew to come back here. I just asked that question. Question is, for us, how are they going to come back if they come back? See, when Nehemiah went back, he didn't go back through the back door creeping in saying, I'll just sit at the back and be quiet and maybe no one will notice me and you know, I'll just sort of blend in and, until people sort of recognize that I'm, that I'm here again. No. He returned as a leader. He returned with resources from the king. He had something to bring when he came back. That's a bit challenging, isn't it? question is, if that happens, how are we going to respond? Are we going to be like the father in the story of the prodigal son, looking out for the one that was lost, rushing towards them, putting our arms around them, putting a ring on their finger, putting a coat around them, killing the fatty calf, or at least going to Sainsbury's and buying them a steak? And, or, or are we going to be like the, prod- like the, like the older brother? I've been here all the time. Where have you been? You know, you've, I've been working. I, I was here all t- during that time and we were shut down. And you know, now we bought this building, this building project. You just want walls back in here. Choice is ours. How will we respond if that happens? My contention is this. It's time to build Shekinah. Charles told us that last week. It's time to build the church. That's not just Shekinah. Some of us have always been here. Not me. I've not always been here. I've only been here a short time. Some of us have come to build the church. Some of us have come to build Penzance or Cornwall or even something bigger. And some of us might fit into more than one of those categories. Don't pigeonhole yourself. And some of us haven't even arrived yet. The important thing is to continue. To do what God says, when God says it, how he says it, to be obedient. In other words, faithfulness. What Nehemiah did was faithfulness. What Ezra did was faithfulness. What Zerubbabel did was faithfulness. It wasn't always the greatest success, but they were faithful men with faithful people around them. And at the end of the story of Nehemiah, not giving any spoilers away because someone else may preach on this later on, After the wall is completed in 52 days, not 19 years, there's a great celebration. 
and the trumpets are blowing and they're singing and they're dancing. And it's a result of what this one man inspired people to do. You know, if ever I want some volunteers for something, I'm going to ask Laura to do the pitch. <laughs> she is fantastic at doing the pitch for getting volunteers. She's so enthusiastic, so inspiring. You know, I wanted to volunteer for the light party, and uh, you know, I'm not really available at that time, unfortunately, so uh, it's a shame. I'd love to, Laura, but you know. Um, so, but Nehemiah was one of those people. What did he bring? He brought vision. He brought prayer. He brought God. He brought the king's resources. And he brought great leadership to inspire people to work side by side, each using their talent to accomplish the work that God had called them to. And that's all we can do. We need to pray for Charles in these next days and months. The pressure is going to be on him. And we need to be there with him, supporting him and encouraging him. We might not agree with everything that he says or everything that he does. Even I don't agree with him all the time. But God has called him to lead this church. And he's called me to be part of it. So, are you stirred? Are you going to be stirred? Are you willing to dig before you can build? Or are you just going to run around like a headless chicken? <laughs> Choice is yours. <laughs> <laughs>